Hello everyone, I'm Z Algar. Are you ready for a leisurely stroll through history's unknowns? You are listening to Travels by Carriage. Let's drive on. In 1911, two ladies published a book. And this book was destined to be the center of what would be called the Moberly Jordan Incident. The book was written over the course of several years by Charlotte Ann Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. They were two teachers who told in the book the tale of their visit to the Palace of Versailles back in 1904. Millions of people visit per year, according to the Palace of Versailles' official website. But there was something unique about the visit by these two teachers. They claimed to have visited the past. So let's go back a bit and examine exactly what they say happened. In the fall of 1903, a school was looking for a new teacher. When I say school, I'm not talking one of those small schoolhouses in a small town. No, I mean a college setting here. Um, different sources say different things, but I believe it was Miss Eleanor, who was already the established teacher, and Miss Charlotte, who was looking to gain a position at the school. Well, at this particular school and with this particular position, the two would be potentially working very close together. So in an effort to make sure that their characters would mesh, they decided to take a trip together. Both women had always wanted to visit Paris, and so it was in the spring of 1904, Charlotte Ann Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain visited the Palace of Versailles in Paris on their very last day in the city. The two decided to visit the palace on the very last day of their trip, and they started their visit by joining, as many others do, a tour group. So they joined this tour group, and they spend a good portion of this sunny but overcast morning looking around and seeing the sights. Eventually, they pause for a break on a bench. So um, the tour group is kind of moving on without them, but they're not really worried about it as the two have a map. So as they're sitting there, they start poring over the map and decide that they would like to see the Petit Trianon before they finish their day. I realize that I'm probably pronouncing this horribly, and I really do apologize. Please leave your tips on French pronunciation. I promise I will try to put it into the next time we use this language in a story. So the two decide to take a break, and they pour over the map, and they decide they want to see the Petit Trianon. What brings them to this decision? Well, I believe it was Miss Eleanor had seen pictures of it in a magazine, and it was kind of one of those last things that she wanted to see before they left the city. So the two take one more glance at the map and decide they have a pretty good idea of where they're headed, and they set off. Now, this is where things get a little odd. They've separated from their tour group. They're following this map. And as they're walking in the direction that they think they're supposed to go, they start to feel a bit strange. Both ladies report just kind of things feeling off. As they continue on the path, they think they should be going. They start to notice fewer and fewer people. And the people that they do see... They're dressed in kind of strange looking clothing. The two said in their book, An Adventure, that everyone looked as though they were dressed for a fancy dress party. Um, they both in particular noticed this one woman who's holding a white cloth outside of a window. Now, when I think white cloth, I usually think like someone is surrendering. That's really all that comes to mind, but that's not really what they're going for here. Neither lady seemed to think that something like that was happening. Um, so if you guys know what that means, maybe she was just doing some laundry. I'm not sure, but they both see this woman. And um, this is kind of the beginning of the tale for each of them, right? They all kind of start their story around when they saw the woman with the cloth. It's at this point that they both agree things felt very odd. The architectural style of the houses and buildings around them seemed different. Everyone seems to be dressed a bit strangely. 
Kelly. And it's around this time that they both start thinking to themselves, okay, one of us is going to need to ask for directions. You know, we've gotten off the path. Something's going on here. Um, and around the time that they start to think this, they see up ahead what is described in their book as a kiosk. Now, I'm not really sure what to make of this. I mean, I'm kind of picturing like like a like a lemonade style deal, lemonade stand style deal here. Oh my goodness, everyone, I can't even speak. Um, I'm, I'm picturing like a lemonade stand, but not for lemonade, like a uh, help here. I don't know. When I think kiosk, I just think of like an information kiosk. So whatever it is they see, be it like a, a stone table or a, a wooden stand of some sort, they see this kiosk. And standing at the kiosk is a man that they both describe as being somewhat intimidating, a little ominous. It doesn't help that feeling that he seems to be covered in scarves of some sort, and it's very noticeable. Um, so, and they, they both just kind of feel like this odd feeling around this guy. And Charlotte mentions, or I'm sorry, Eleanor mentions that she's kind of wondering if Charlotte is going to ask this guy for directions. And it's around this time, I think both women are kind of wondering who's going to ask, um, when this man, a second man, runs up to the two of them, well, the three of them. It's around this time that a man runs up to the three of them. You've got Miss Charlotte, you've got Eleanor, you've got this um, scarred man at the kiosk, and now you have what is described as a red-faced man. So both of the women describe this guy as very animated. He seems to be flustered. He's sweating. His face is red. He's um, definitely excited about something. And he tells to the women in perfect French, no, no, don't go this way kind of gesturing towards the path he had just come from. Don't go this way. Go towards the house. And he points to another path, a smaller path that leads over a small bridge. Um, and for whatever reason, both of the women just kind of feel immediately like they need to do what he said. Like this whole time, they've kind of felt this odd sensation. They feel out of place. Something strange is going on here. But when this guy speaks to them, they feel, for whatever reason, like maybe he has an inkling of going on, of what's going on. That's the impression that I got. They certainly feel like he's sharing their urgency to get out of here. So they both decide they're going to take the path. He says, you know, thank you very much. We'll be on our way. So the path that he's pointing them towards goes over a small bridge. This is going to be important later. So remember the bridge. And once they get across the bridge, Eleanor says that she sees a woman sketchy. Now, Charlotte will say later that she never noticed this woman, but Eleanor is very firm in her belief that she saw a woman sketching on the grounds. And as they were kind of leaving the area where she could see this woman, they're following this path that they were told to take. And as they're following this path and kind of getting out of view of this woman, they see the same, well, Eleanor sees the same red-faced man run up to her and tell her something in a very excited manner. And Eleanor says the woman looks a bit concerned um, and puts her drawing down and seems to like look towards where the man is gesturing. And that's kind of the last thing that we hear about this woman. Now, I will read for you a quote uh, from Eleanor about the time that she spent just briefly gazing at this woman. So she says, I looked straight at her, but some indiscernible feeling made me turn away, annoyed at her being there. Now, I at first was like, why annoyed? Like, she's not bothering you. She's just sketching on the ground. But then I'm wondering if it has to do with this whole, like, sense of oddness that they say they felt. Does... Is this annoyance kind of like a, hey, she shouldn't be here response? Like, I, I don't know. That's where my brain was going with it because of the claims that they're going to make seven years later when they publish this book in 1911. So let's get through what actually happened first. So they round a corner. They can't see the sketching lady anymore. Remember, Charlotte never noticed this lady, but Eleanor was firm that she saw her. 
So they round a corner and they see a building up ahead. And from a side door of the building comes another gentleman who waves them over and says, you know, this way, this way. Um, they go the way that he tells them. He takes them through a room and they come out another door into an outdoor space. And there, finally, this feeling of, of odd, strange occurrences or, or atmosphere is gone. It's just gone. Everything feels fine, right? There's tourists all around them, hustling and bustling. They can even see the tour group that they were with before kind of dissolving because that's finished now. Um, and they're back. They're good. Okay, that was odd. They don't talk about it for a few weeks. Because what are you going to say? I mean, hey, I got this really weird feeling when we walk by those people who were dressed weird. I mean, they just don't talk about it at first. But eventually, after they get back home, um, the new teacher gets settled in her role. A few weeks go by and they start to share occurrences. Hey, did you notice that lady with the white cloth thing? I mean, she was dressed kind of strange, wasn't she? And like, what was with that building she was standing in? So they start to talk about it. And they do try to kind of like share their experience with some other people and even what they think might have happened, which I'm getting to. But they're not really met with anyone who kind of thinks what they think. No one is on their page here. And so they decide that they're going to really dive in and do the research. Remember, these two women are teachers. I was a teacher once before. We'll talk about that on another day. But I can tell you that teachers are very serious about um, academia. I shouldn't speak for everyone, but most of the teachers I've ever met, they're very serious about supporting their claims and research and the importance of it. And so these women will spend from 1904 to 1911, seven years researching the claim that I'm about to share with you now. Looking over my notes one last time before the big reveal, although I think I mentioned it in the beginning. So in 1911, they publish their account of what happened, and the title of this book is called An Adventure. They publish it under some uh, pseudo names, though, some, uh, some pen names, because remember, I said when they floated this information out in the past, nobody was really on their page with it. Nobody was really on board with what they were saying. So they published it under the names of Elizabeth Morrison and Francis Lamont. And this is free, available on archive.org. Again, it's called An Adventure. I recommend you go and give it a read. The language is a little dated, but honestly, I found it surprisingly simple to read through and, and fun. So if you're a reader, give it a go. Um, so they published this book in 1911, and in this book, they claim that they traveled back in time when they took this wrong path. And not only do they claim that they've traveled back in time and they have support for it, but that they know exactly when they traveled to. All right, so this has piqued my interest, right? I first found out about this because somewhere down a rabbit hole that I went off of Reddit one night, I heard about the Moberly Jourdain incident and what a title. It's so exciting. And then once you hear that it has to do with potential time travel, hello, I'm here for it. So let's talk about the reasons why they were convinced that what happened to them was more than just getting lost. So I already mentioned that the architecture had changed as they got lost. This ended up being even more than I implied because when the two women started talking about this a few weeks after they initially got home, they pulled up a map of the Palace of Versailles and they tried to figure out where they had been. So they're pouring over this map and they don't see some of the buildings that they know they saw where they should be. So that's strange, right? So they start to eventually look through maps of the past to try to find these buildings. And lo and behold, as they get further back in history, they start to uncover some maps that really do show these buildings that they saw. Okay, that's strange. So they start to research the fashion and the dress of, um, of the French throughout history. And, and when might they have seen the kind of clothing that they saw? So that helps them narrow it down as well. 
Um, so they pour over resources, maps, documents, paintings for seven years to build this claim. And here's some of the things they think they discover. Um, the first being the buildings. They find these buildings on the map. The second being they think they know who the kiosk guy is, right? The guy that they found so ominous who seemed to be covered in scars. Well, guess what? In the early, well, not early, the late 18, <clears throat> let me just redo that whole thing. <clears throat> in the late 1700s, in the court of Versailles, there lived a gentleman by the name of Comte de Vaudreuil. Now, I apologize. I know I'm not saying that correctly, so I'm going to spell it for you all. It's C-O-M-T-E-D-E. V-A-U-D-R-I-E-L. And again, I do apologize for my pronunciation. So the reason they think it's this guy, he was um, very interested in a woman who was very close to Marie Antoinette. Um, I kind of can see her name, like, written down in my head, but to try to pronounce it would just be brutal, and I don't know the exact spelling, so I'm going to leave it unknown, but I will say at one point she was the governess to the children of France, so if you look that up on Google, you'll come across this woman. She was very close to the queen, Marie Antoinette, in the late 1700s, and so this guy was known to have been involved with her, and the dress that the gentleman at the kiosk was wearing kind of fits the time that this Comte de Vaudreuil was at court, but even more so, he was known to have been covered in scars from smallpox. Now, smallpox wasn't so rare back then, unfortunately, but having someone who had those scars who regularly showed up in court at the same time in history as maps that show the buildings that these women saw, they feel like they're starting to build a case. So here's where we come back to the sketching woman. Um, again, Charlotte said that she didn't notice this woman. She didn't go so far as to say that she wasn't there. She just said, I didn't notice her. Uh, but Eleanor was sure. And the more she poured over, over historical documents and um, paintings of the aristocracy that lived in the palace when these buildings that they saw were built. Um, she eventually comes to believe that this is Marie Antoinette herself. Um, furthermore, she eventually comes to claim that they can pinpoint the time of their visit to three weeks before the historical revolution of France. And she believes that the red-faced man had run up to tell Marie Antoinette that the people were coming to the palace. Oh my God, I just got goosebumps a little bit. Like, wouldn't that be crazy? I don't know, I don't know. I'm not saying I do or do not believe her, but I'm saying that's wild if, if that would be the case. So another piece of evidence, if you will, to support what they were saying, they were able to find a map um, of the around the 1780s because they believe they've pinpointed it to 1784. So they find a map around that time frame um, that shows the kiosk. That seems to show the kiosk where they think they saw Comte de Vaudreuil. Again, apologies. Um, but they can see this kiosk. They can see the buildings that they saw that aren't on current maps. And they've seen the paintings of Comte de Vaudreuil. And they've seen the paintings of Marie Antoinette. And so they believe that they've pinpointed all of this. And they print it and they put it in the book, as I said, that's published in 1911. Of course, they're met with criticisms. Immediately, people are like, these women just got lost. Admittedly, they'd never been to Paris. They'd definitely never been to the Palace of Versailles. They got off track, maybe saw some area of the palace that they weren't really supposed to see. And the biggest thing that the skeptics grabbed onto was the bridge. They said there is no bridge that fits that description at the Palace of Versailles, and there never has been. There never has been. So the big 
claim by the skeptics is that they were on a different bridge that is in the Palace of Versailles, but it's significantly bigger, and the teachers would go on to say that this was definitely not the bridge that they were on, but this is what the skeptics say. And to give you an idea of how popular this was, now this is 1911, right? This is the time of mysticism. This is the time of Aleister Crowley. Um, and the wife of the head of the Society for Psychical Research came out against Eleanor and Charlotte saying that either the two were confused or they were making it up completely, that they were sure that these women had not traveled back in time. So what do you think Charlotte and Eleanor do? Now remember, they're academics, they're teachers out of college, and they did the research. And so, you know, I have to imagine from their point of view, they're telling you what they found, right? I'm going to tell you right now, friends, that they never back down from these claims. They never back down from these claims. They listen to these critics, and you know what they do? Two years later, they republish the book as a second edition and include a question and answer section where they take on many of the harshest criticisms against their claim. And one of them is the bridge, right? Everybody is saying that the only bridge there doesn't match up with their description. It can't possibly have happened, blah, 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 all this stuff. But guess what? After the original publishing of the book, um, a, a historical society, I'm sorry, my sources didn't tell me who found this, but it was found and made popularized in the historical community. They found a map, you all, that dates to around 1784. Bingo! And guess what? It has a little bridge. I kid you not. There is a small bridge on this map that they find, and it seems to unearth this kind of time and history that really they hadn't quite gotten close to with these maps, um, with the maps that they have found yet. So in their Q&A for the follow-up second edition of their book, An Adventure, Charlotte Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain reveal that they have now found a map that confirms this bridge that they said was there. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that kind of brings us to the end of this story. Um, they both lived pretty long lives. I think they both made it to their 60s and 70s, and they both claimed to the very end this definitely happened. So, um, again, the book is completely free on archive.org. I'll post some links. Uh, this was the first time I've ever recorded something like this. So I appreciate any tips and tricks that you guys can share. This has been Travels by Carriage with Z Algar. I hope you'll join me next week when we'll hear about a very famous invention you've probably used many times that was stolen by someone's bestie. See you soon, listeners. Do you like uh, scary stuff? Yeah.